Good evening, everyone, and a very warm virtual welcome to Sir John Soane's Museum and this, the second of our online exhibitions talks featuring Rory Stewart on walking across Afghanistan. My name is Louise Stewart and I'm the curator of exhibitions at Sir John Soane's Museum. And I'm absolutely delighted to see that so many of you have been able to join us this evening. This talk has been organised to complement our current exhibition, The Romance of Ruins, The Search for Ancient Ionia 1764, which is free to visit either at the museum or online on our website. So this evening, what I'd like to do is just to give you a brief introduction to the exhibition and some of the resonances between Rory's experiences and those of our 18th century travellers. I'll then hand over to R Rory. Uh, his talk will be followed by a brief conversation between us, and then we'll open the floor to a Q&A from the audience. So if you do think of any questions that you'd like to address to Rory during the evening, please type them in the Zoom Q&A box that you can see at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try and get through as many of them as we can. So the exhibition, The Romance of Ruins, focuses on a series of powerful and poetic watercolours produced by the young artist William Pars uh, on an expedition to Afghanistan in 1764. Uh, it was intended to discover and document the ruins of ancient sites in Western Anatolia and Greece. And it was sponsored by the Society of, the D of Dilettanti with the aim of discovering ancient Greek sites relating to ancient Ionia, which was an alliance of 12 Greek city-states, um, which was famous in the 16th century BC for uh, its um, enlightenment culture and monumental temple building. So the expedition was led by classicist Richard Chandler, along with the architect Nicholas Rivet uh, and a young artist, William Pars. Um, and I'm just going to try and show you some of the images from the exhibition. There we are. Um, here you can see Chandler on the right, uh, looking very self-assured on the ferry with his horse. Uh, in the middle is the architect, Nicholas Rivette, uh, and the Westerner on the left on a white horse is William Pars, the young artist who produced these amazing watercolors. He was only 22 when he was appointed to the expedition. They set off from Gravesend in June 1764, taking two months to reach Constantinople. And they spent the next two years traveling around sites in Western Anatolia or modern Turkey, uh, throughout the Ottoman Empire and then to Greece, making written and drawn accounts of the ruins, landscape and people that they encountered. Chandler published an account of the expedition uh, after they returned back to Britain. And like Rory's writing, it's incredibly evocative. Along with Parr's watercolours, it outlines the transcendent moments when the travellers encountered monumental ruins like this stadium. Uh, and they're all at the landscapes that they saw in the Ottoman Empire. It also describes the hardships that they faced, including traveling for long distances by foot or on horseback, carrying everything they needed for their two year tour. They often camped amidst the ancient ruins and you can see that in the detail of this image just here where we've got the traveler's tent on the left and you can see them drawing or writing and smoking inside it. Uh, and outside we've got a pile of weapons and a band of local attendants. Uh, and I think the weapons are really testament to the sense of threat that these travellers often felt during their expedition. Bands of brigands roamed the countryside, often threatening them, and local ayahs or rulers uh, were key to their success in that uh, they relied on their permission to visit and document the ancient sites. And while sometimes they were very welcoming and hospitable, at other times they were rather hostile. So the travellers' local guides protected them and helped them to negotiate the complex codes of Ottoman society. And we can see them in this image. And the expedition's success was in large part down to their involvement. The 1764 expedition was part of a long tradition of Western explorers travelling to Asia and vice versa. 
Their written accounts of their journeys allowed readers to travel vicariously to distant places, but also coloured perceptions of those far off lands. And that's a tradition that continues today, of course, in the work of our guest tonight, Rory Stewart. So after a brief career as an infantry officer, he served as a diplomat for the UK government in Indonesia, the Balkans and Iraq. He founded and ran the Turquoise Mountain Foundation in Afghanistan, and he was the director of the Carr Center and Ryan Family Professor of Human Rights at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. He also had a very successful political career, serving as UK Secretary of State for International Development and in, another of, uh, in a number of other ministerial roles. In 2019, he was a candidate for the leadership of the Conservative Party. And since 2020, he's been a senior fellow at the Jackson Institute uh, at Yale University. He focuses on contemporary politics in crisis and on international development and intervention in fragile and conflict affected states. Stuart's the author of four books, including The Places in Between, the celebrated account of his walk across Afghanistan. And that, of course, is what we're all here to hear about this evening. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Rory Stewart. Well, firstly, thank you very, very much for coming along. Um, and the key thing really uh, about the talk uh, this evening is in relation to the Johnson Museum. And many of you will have had an opportunity, I hope, to visit it in London. But if you don't, please visit. And please, in particular, take opportunities hopefully of the lifting of some of the lockdown restrictions to see the incredible exhibition around this Ionian expedition. And I, I want to touch on it very briefly, and then I'm gonna to try to connect it a little bit to my own travels. I think the first thing to say is that, yes, there are similarities between what I did and what Chandler and Rivette and Paz did. One of them is that we were both quite young. I'm like Chandler, I was in my late twenties, Paz was actually in his mid twenties when he did the exhibition expedition. And I think the second thing is that, of course, for both of us, there is a very interesting resonance between the ancient ruins that you're looking at and the nature of a contemporary modern society, the society of the people who live where those ruins are now located. But I don't need to say that, of course, in many other ways, uh, my journey was completely different. I obviously made the journey uh, more than 200 years after them in a very different historical context and with very different ways of thinking about the world and looking at the world, of ways of looking at the world which continue to change. So the slides that I'm about to show you go back to a walk that I did in the winter of 2001, 2002 across Afghanistan. Then I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the work that I've done uh, restoring buildings in Kabul in Afghanistan and then a little bit about some work that we're looking at now in Jordan with a Roman site in Jordan. To put it in context though, the journey that you're seeing was part of a much longer journey, journey uh, which went on for nearly 20 months, which took me on foot across from the Turkish border across Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, and Nepal. I walked 20, 25 miles a day, and I stayed every night in a different village house. So I ended up, I think, sleeping in about 550 different village houses. But certainly the most memorable, interesting part of my journey was my walk across Afghanistan. And it's that that I'm gonna show you some slides of, and I'll try to, if I can, uh, draw attention a little bit to um, the similarities with the journey that you are seeing. Here we go. Right, hopefully now you can see on the screen some images. And this is the very beginning of my journey. I was walking across from Herat in the west of Afghanistan, well, in the east of Afghanistan. And as is true of the travelers that you'll be seeing in the Sohn Museum, I was very influenced by very ancient writings. In fact, one of the interesting things about travelers is how obsessed they are with what earlier travelers have said. I was reading an Arab geographer called Ibn Halkul, who describes this landscape in the ninth century. So for example, he said that the land was flat for the first seven days walk east of Herat, and that's indeed what I found. 
But I was also reading the diary of the Mughal Emperor Babur, who did the journey at the very beginning of the 1500s. This is coming towards the uh, first night, and this is a caravanserai. These are these enormous fortified buildings which were created for the Silk Road. And I could almost pace my journey by them because they were built a day's walk apart, so generally 20, 25 miles apart, and they were set up for travelers, camels, caravans, all the silks, all the treasures uh, of Asia, and indeed moving the other direction, goods from Europe to cross. But ruins, and this is something that becomes clear uh, when you look at William Paz's drawings, are not just ruins of the distant past. In countries like Afghanistan, indeed this was true in the Ottoman Empire when they were traveling in the 18th century, also the more recent past. So that is a Russian anti-tank carrier, which you can see abandoned there on the road. And it's also an insight into much more modern problems. So these donkeys are loaded with opium on their way uh, to the market. Afghanistan at that time produced 92% of the world's heroin and still received nearly $4 billion a year in international aid. This was a man who walked with me for a, a, a few days, in fact. I generally walked alone, but in this case, the governor of Herat had tried to insist that this man, Abdul Haq, walk alongside me. And the sense of violence and the sense of absence of government was very real. The country had been controlled, obviously, by the Taliban for the previous few years. The Taliban government had just fallen as I started walking. Before that, Afghanistan had been in civil war. Before that, it had been under a Soviet occupation. So many of the communities that I was walking in hadn't really seen the central government uh, for years or even decades. And this man walking with me, who was theoretically a representative of the interior ministry in Herat, was embodying the central government, trying to bring it with me into these areas as we walked. But he did it in a very strange way that often involved threatening small children with his gun, shooting at passing birds. And I became increasingly interested in trying to persuade Abdul Haq to leave me because I felt it would be better for me and for him and indeed for the communities if I traveled alone. Now, we're talking about ruins. Here then, about a week into the journey, I came across the first very dramatic example of a ruin. This dome has been hit in the top right hand corner by a Russian tank shell. It is the mausoleum of a dancing uh, and walking dervish who brought Islam into India in the 12th century. And it's a fragmentary relic of a lost civilization, of an empire that had once stretched from Delhi to Baghdad, an empire that was ruled by a man called Sultan Giyasuddin Ghori ibn Sam, and an empire that made the mistake of challenging Genghis Khan in the uh, early 1200s and then vanishing from history. It had a famous capital called the capital of the Turquoise Mountain, and that capital was then lost. And one of the themes of my journey was trying to trace through the ruins this lost civilization. But as I say, ruins are not only old, they're also new. This is a ruin of a Russian dam, which was once supposed to provide electricity for the whole of Western Afghanistan that had been abandoned during the war. This man on my left in this photograph had tried to shoot at me. I was too embarrassed on this occasion to ask him why he was trying to shoot at me. I'm the guy sitting in the middle, looking a bit uh, petrified because the man having tried to shoot at me then turned up and wanted to have his photograph taken. Of me. I asked him when I saw him again 18 months later why he had tried to shoot me and he explained that Nadir Shah, who's sitting immediately on his left, uh, Mullah Mustafa who tried to shoot me some man with a pen and paper in his hand, had bet him that he couldn't hit me. This is Shah who I turned up in his community and everybody in the village was descended from a single great grandfather. And he had memorized the entire Quran from end to end, which is like memorizing something considerably longer than memorizing the New Testament from end to end. He's probably about nine years old. Then I went out onto the roof in the morning and I saw this dog. And the villagers were very kind and gave me this dog, which then walked with me. A glimpse of politics. The man standing with my walking stick in his hand next to that column is 
the Member of Parliament for the largest, most sparsely populated constituency in Afghanistan interested me because I was briefly the, well, actually for 10 years, the Member of Parliament for the largest, most sparsely populated constituency in England. But he's an interesting example of government power in Afghanistan. And this would have been true also with dealing with power holders for people like Rivet when they were looking at these Ionian antiquities and their journey in the mid 1700s. They were dealing with Ottoman governors who were having to deal with incredible changes in power uh, in Istanbul. And this man too managed to survive really as a power holder because he was a substantial local figure through every type of change. He'd been an official under the King of Afghanistan. And when the King was toppled by his cousin, Daud Khan, in a coup d'etat in 1972, he became an official under the nationalist government to Daud Khan. When Daud Khan was toppled by a uh, pro, Moscow government of Nur Mohammed Karaki and assassinated in this presidential palace in 1978, he became an official under the new pro-Moscow government. When Nur Mohammed Karaki was in turn assassinated in September 1979, he became an official under the pro-Cuban government of Hafiz Amin. When Hafiz Amin was assassinated on the same side for the presidential palace uh, by Russian Spetsnaz stormtroopers and the end of December 79, he became an official under the Soviet occupation of Babrak Kamal. When Babrak Kamal was toppled in the coup d'etat in 86, he joined the CIA-backed resistance to the Soviet Union. He then became a Taliban commander. When I saw him, he was in hiding because he just tried to assassinate the governor of Herat. But you'll be delighted to hear he's back in power again today as the director of children's services. Now, one of the interesting aspects of looking at antiquities, it doesn't matter whether you're uh, Chandler and Rivette doing this in the 1750s, which is the wonderful exhibition that hopefully you're going to see at the same museum, or myself doing this in 2001, 2002, is the fantastic landscapes through which you're moving. In this particular case, I'm crossing a 14,000 foot ridge. Coming over the top of that ridge, it's a gratuitous picture of my dog eating snow, and into this very narrow gorge. Narrow Gorge may remind some of you that have seen it perhaps of the approach to the treasury at Petra, to a very, very narrow gorge. And at the end of it, I found this. Now, this uh, was first seen by a foreigner in the 1950s, first seen and recorded by a foreigner in the 1950s. But like all the antiquities that Chandra and Rivette uh, documented, it was, of course, very well known to the local population. But also, like the antiquities that Chandra Rivet documented, it was an abandoned site. The nearest village was about a mile and a half away. Nobody lived there. It wasn't a very good place to live, it wasn't a very good place to live because it's in a very narrow gorge that only gets sun about two hours a day because it can only be approached over a 15,000 foot pass. And therefore, when it was first found, it was a real mystery to archaeologists who looked at it. They carefully examined the shaft of this tower and discovered that written in Kufic calligraphy around the shaft is the Miriam Surah of the Quran, the Surah from the Quran about Mary, the mother of Jesus. And then in turquoise blue tiles around the neck is written Sultan Giyasuddin Guri ibn Sam, King of Kings. And this, of course, was the king of this great empire, the turquoise mountain empire that once stretched from Delhi to Baghdad. And it is. I believe, although there's still some controversy about this, the minaret of what had once been a great Friday mosque. And the reason that it's the only thing that you can see in the landscape is again, I believe, because when Genghis Khan destroyed this empire, he deliberately obliterated every building, leaving this single minaret standing. And I think he did it in order to display his power, in order to display the extremity of his destruction he wanted one thing to remain so that you could guess when you visited, in this case, 800 years later, at what had once been on the site. To give you a sense of scale, that's a horse at the bottom. This thing is taller than Nelson's column. I climbed up to the top of it. I uh, fell uh, and almost felt as I fell down it that the tower was shaking and I was going to die taking down one of the last great monuments of the lost civilization. But I was surprised when I got to the bottom to see People, not so surprised to see the goat in the saddlebag of the cow, because there's not much for a goat to eat, but surprised to see people and surprised to see that people were digging into the ground. 
And they were digging out of the ground carved ivory chess pieces, fragments of Chinese porcelain, carved wooden doors, gold amulets. In other words, they were looting a site which had been destroyed by Genghis Khan, lost to history, and which they had just uncovered in the two weeks before I arrived. But in the process of uncovering it, were of course destroying it again. And all these objects found their way to traders. I eventually saw that gold amulet in a museum in Kuwait six years later. It's the Hazara community of central Afghanistan. This is a glimpse of the landscape that we're crossing. This is uh, myself, my footprints crossing the lake of Bandi Amir with my dog, frozen lake. And this is the Taliban. So these buildings, of course, that I was showing you had been destroyed by Genghis Khan. Others have collapsed by neglect. But this is the other major way in which things are destroyed, which is by deliberate recent assault. The Taliban were conducting a genocidal attack on the Hazara community of central Afghanistan, partly because they're Shia. That's somebody's front room that has been burnt. You can see it's rendered in soot. This is the village of Shaidan, and the entire community had left that village and gone to refugee camps in Pakistan and Iran. In fact, for three days, I walked through nothing but abandoned villages. Here again, a piece of Russian armor abandoned. And this is another, perhaps for many of you, very famous uh, example of the Taliban and their brutality. This is the giant Buddha in Bamiyan which the Taliban had blown up shortly before my arrival. And that Buddha had stood there uh, since the sixth century. So it had been standing for nearly 1400 years until the Taliban blew it up, much in the way that ISIS destroyed quite a lot of objects in Palmyra and around Nineveh and Mosul more recently. They didn't just destroy it, they actually burnt this frescoed cave where monks used to meditate and threw their shoes up on the ceiling in order to show their contempt uh, for Buddhism. And in doing so, they destroyed something very precious because what's unique about early medieval Afghan civilization is that it had an extraordinary, it's an extraordinary meeting point of different civilizations. Alexander the Great, of course, got to Afghanistan, but what he encountered in Afghanistan was a Persian civilization that met India. And Afghanistan developed an extraordinary culture of art that brought together the art of Greece, Persia, and India, perhaps most famously in these extraordinary haunting statues of the Buddha, which show the influence of Greek sculpture, but of course representations of an Indian uh, religious leader. And it is here in Bamiyan that not just the Persian, the Greek and the Indian civilizations come together, but even the Chinese civilizations. One of the very earliest accounts of Bamiyan is by a Chinese monk who traveled through. You need to imagine this place once filled almost like Lhasa with people in South and robes, with conches, with bells, a great monastic community. Right, now let me give you a very brief glimpse then of other bits of work that I've done in trying to do some uh, working with ruins and archaeological restoration. Uh, when I turned up in Kabul, I found that the center of the old city, an area called Muradhani, was collapsing. It's an example of one of the first buildings I saw. And we began to work together. I set up a small charity, uh, eventually built it up to 300 people. We cleared 25,000 small trucks of garbage out of the area, creating employment for every unemployed adult male. We paved and leveled the streets. And here are some big and after shots of some of the buildings we've restored. This is before and after. This is before and after. This is before, during, after, before and after. Oh, in doing so, we have turned these buildings back into some of them into people's houses. We've restored nearly 150 houses, um, but also clinic, primary school for the community and an institute for training traditional craftspeople. And we've restored the bazaar and begun to sell Afghan crafts, jewelry, woodwork, and particularly carpets around the world to sustain the project. 
And let me just give you a final glimpse because we're looking at Ionian remains of a project that we're now looking at following in the footsteps of the Johnstone Museum and Chandler and Ravel and indeed uh, William Pars, which is a classical site in Northern Jordan. This is right on the a peak overlooking the Golan Heights and the Sea of Galilee. It's looking down on the Sea of Galilee. I'm uh, moving to Jordan uh, in a few weeks time and I'll be there for most of the next couple of years uh, on the current plan working with this site. Uh, so that's it from the air. And you can see, this is a, this is a picture taken a few weeks ago. Um, actually a lot of the stuff that you'll see in this exhibition visible in the site, Roman capitals lying on the ground, it's Roman shops, Ottoman houses. One of the lovely things about this site is unlike many places like Ephesus and Acropolis, where later archeologists cleared out living communities and living villages, this is an area where the Ottoman houses remain. They're built of course from the Roman ruins, um, but they continue to be inhabited quite recently and our hope is to restore them and bring some of the community back and get some sustainable tourism going. You can see it's spring, some Roman mosaics. And you can see the, 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 the sort of way the mosaics are being invaded by thorns. And you can get a bit of a glimpse of, I think, something that's very important to William Pars and his drawings, which is the romance of ruins. The sense that in a way, there's something more mesmerizing about that photograph than there would be if those columns were still standing. And on that I finish. So let me bring you back to Zoom and hand back. Let me just get this thing. Sorry, I'm going to get us back. Hopefully, stopping sharing. There we are. Right, there we are. Back to Louise. Rory, thank you so much. That was fascinating. You really shine a light on uh, this incredibly rich and complex history of Afghanistan as well. And really exciting to hear about the new project in Jordan too. Uh, so much resonance with Pars and Chandler and Rivette, it looks like one of their sites. It, it, it does very much lose. And it, it's actually really interesting if that image behind you, of course, mm -hmm. could be taken from one of those sites. Remember those Ionian sites that they're looking at were often heavily restored by people like the Emperor Hadrian. So a lot of what you're looking at in places like Ephesus um, show that the same thing that we're working on in Umkais, which is that transition from the Hellenistic culture, originally Greek, then under Alexander the Great, through to the Romans. And then, of course, its absorption into the modern Middle East. Absolutely, yeah. And that intersection with the, the Ottoman houses built using the ruins, um, yeah, it just goes to show that, that sense of continuity. Um, now, we are going to open the floor to a Q&A very shortly, and I can see we've already got quite a few questions. But I just wanted to ask you, Rory, before we do that, I've heard you speak elsewhere, and indeed this evening, in a really sophisticated way about visual imagery. And yet you chose not to illustrate your book. And I just wondered uh, about your sort of relationship with images of Afghanistan, if you could speak a little bit about that. Yeah, well, I think this is a really um, important subject because of course the problem is that somebody like me turning up in Afghanistan is very much a foreigner. And the impressions that I get of Afghanistan are the impressions of somebody who's been there for a few days and that means that obviously a lot of what you're seeing reflects your prejudices, reflects what you're bringing to the story already. I had to work very carefully when I was writing to try to make sure that I didn't over romanticize, that I didn't exclude the modern world. So I was very, very keen when I was writing about Herat to make sure that I included a plastic crisp packets imported from Iran as much as stories of silk imported from China in the Middle Ages that I was able to get a sense that this is a place with ruined Russian dams from the 1980s, as well as a place with um, you know, early 13th century objects. But it is nevertheless a very, very, um, you don't want to mislead in the other direction either. In some ways, what makes Afghanistan so startling is that much more 
of a sense of the ancient world remains than would be the case if you were, for example, walking through Cumbria in England. Um, people have a very, very strong sense of oral history. Right? You go to a village in Cumbria, in my constituency, 92% of the people in Crosby Ravensworth were not born in Crosby Ravensworth. That's a real fact, right? They came from. Um, whereas that community, to Honey Rizak, everybody is descended from a single great grandfather. And people want to talk about the fact that that was the hill which Genghis Khan came across. They can recite 28 generations of their own genealogies going back. I will find myself crossing a snow plain and seeing a man riding towards me, literally on a white horse with a huge turban out of the sunset. So you are struggling all the time to balance your desire not to over-romanticize, right? Not to, as it were, orientalize what's going on with the fact that of course, it is a culture whose sense of dress whose habits of life are very, very different uh, from those that you're used to in Britain, or indeed than you would see in somewhere like Thailand or Indonesia, which are in many ways much, much more assimilated into the modern world. You know, I worked as a diplomat in Indonesia and, you know, I could travel to very outlying islands and everyone was still in jeans and t-shirts and talking to me about David Beckham. That wasn't so true in Afghanistan. Yeah, I think the book really does give that complex picture. Um, I can see that we've got 16 questions already, so I suspect that we should move to the questions uh, from the floor. Uh, and Rory, I'll, I'll take your lead here. Are there particular things that you want to address? Okay, well, let me have a look at this. So Tome has asked about language learning and travels. So he said, how good was your Farsi before going? Would it have been dangerous to go without knowing as much as you did? Have you tips on mixing travel and language learning? Um, and David Besom has said, were you making notes? How and when did you learn diary? And there's also someone who's asked, which might be a good place to start. Why, why did you do it? Okay, very good. Okay. So uh, the question of why I did it, I think is probably more difficult to answer. I mean, the, the answer is that um, I felt very strongly without probably much reason that I needed to walk around the world, that somehow the life that I was living uh, as a British diplomat in embassies in places like Indonesia was cutting me off from the reality of rural life. I'd read Bruce Chapman's song lines. I'd been very inspired by the idea of walking meditation. I was fascinated by the idea that maybe I could remember a line of footprints going all the way around the world. I loved the idea of being able to Across somewhere like Afghanistan in the middle of the winter, which you can't do unless you walk. There are no, you know, vehicles, cars can't get through the snow. Um, but at some level also, it was a sort of adventure. I mean, it, it, the thing that I got from it in the end, I mean, maybe I didn't really intend it, but the product of it was the extraordinary privilege of being able to stay in those 550 village houses because I could only walk 20, 25 miles a day, and I was walking through very remote areas where there were no hotels, um, I would turn up in a village and sort of randomly, I mean, I think that's the other thing about walking. Those very short distances you're traveling means that you can't be heading for a sort of tourist destination. In fact, walking across Iran, I would often find myself very, very close to incredibly famous uh, archeological sites, by which I mean, you know, only 11 or 12 miles away to my west, right? Which obviously in a car would take you about 10 minutes to drive. Uh, but when you're walking, I actually often would not go there. I wouldn't leave my journey because it would take me um, a whole day to walk there and back. I, and I'd feel that I'd have to keep going. Um, and so instead of seeing the great sights, Right. Almost nowhere I saw in any of these countries were places that you can find in a Lonely Planet guide. I found myself going into villages that just happened to be on the route, but often on quite ancient, interesting routes, because of course I was walking the most direct foot routes. And often villagers would say to me, how long has it taken you to walk from Herat? And I'd say, it's taken me 12 days. And they'd say, that's rubbish. My grandfather did it in 10 days walk. Right? So there was a sense that there was a, um, a natural connection and a reason for these communities. 
but it also meant some very frustrating things. I remember in Iran turning up in a village, seeing a huge mound, climbing onto this mound and finding the mound was full of human bones everywhere. Endless sort of human skulls and, and it was enormous this mound. I mean, and no one in the village could tell me what it was. And of course, no guidebook could tell me what it was because this was a, a village which nobody had documented in any of the guidebooks that I could find or see leaving me to speculate, was it a place where the Zoroastrians had exposed their dead for sky burials, which would take it back a very, very long way? Was it a tell, a ruined fort where people had been killed? What was I to make of this place? And, and that's another thing which again connects back to Louise, to your um, exhibition. Because of course, I was then closer to the situation that Chandler was in, where he didn't really have any guidebooks to inform him of what he was really looking at. He was having to guess whether this particular city was something that he'd read about or not. He was having to guess what the buildings were that he was looking at. And he was also dealing with the fact, and this was true for him and it was true for me, and of course it was true for travelers in Afghanistan in the mid 19th century, that often the local community weren't that interested in the remains that surrounded them or had eccentric ideas about what they were. Now, this isn't just a sort of comment about people in other countries. I remember walking along Hadrian's Wall and coming across a sheep farmer who his family had been farming that bit of land for many, many generations, possibly hundreds of years. And he said to me cheerfully, oh, that ditch you're walking in is, I believe, an, an Iron Age fortification, right? Now, it wasn't it was a ditch dug by the Romans as part of their defensive lines around Hadrian's Wall, right? But he, um, but it was interesting to see there he was living on top of it, had grown up on top of it, um, wasn't very interested in reading any books about it and had developed a sort of rather different idea of it. So that the Afghans, for example, who lived around the Buddhas at Bamiyan, when uh, it was first seen in the uh, mid 19th century, didn't realize that these were statues of Buddhas had a whole series of different ideas about what they might be statues of. But of course they'd been Muslim for uh, a thousand years. And so they had no idea what Buddhism was and had no sense that these were Buddhas. Right, that's enough on why. Let me try to, uh, Louise, let, I'll let you choose the questions. Maybe that's the best thing to do. So we've got someone here asking about, um, you have a unique insight into many lands riven by recent conflicts. How hopeful are you for sustainable, peaceful solutions? So, um, sustainable, peaceful solutions. Um, I think very, very difficult. That isn't because of the people. I mean, I, I'm very certain that, and I think this is true. I mean, I, I have a very strong sense of this because my part of Cumbria, the Scottish English border was a very, very violent place for 400 years place the border reef is from 1200 to 1600, one of the most violent places on earth. It's kind of, but it was like that, not because the people, it was like that because the politics, it's like that because two neighboring countries, in that case, England and Scotland were fighting a proxy war. And Afghanistan basically is a continual victim of proxy wars, proxy wars between the 1980s, between America and the Soviet Union. Uh, in the 1990s between different Islamist factions, particularly with Pakistan, and now with Pakistan, Iran, Russia, India, the US, the UK, and 20 other countries all involved. And the problem is that it might be tempting for President Biden to think that by withdrawing from Afghanistan, somehow it's gonna become more peaceful. All he's really doing is removing one of the actors. Pakistan, Iran, Russia, and others will continue to be involved. Uh, leading to this very, very tormented, strange existence. But that doesn't mean that you want to give up because in fact, if you look at all we've done with Turquoise Mountain, sorry, somebody asked in the chat what the name of the charity was in Kabul. It's called Turquoise Mountain, which is what we're, and it, that's who, um, that, that's the charity that's working in Jordan as well on that Roman site I showed you. Um, that is uh, able to do all that, right? Able to restore the center of the old city of Kabul We've uh, managed to support craftspeople. We've actually managed to do nearly $15 million worth of craft sales out of Afghanistan, Burma, Jordan, you know, places which are in difficult situations. Burma at the moment with a military coup and very bad COVID. Afghanistan again goes through COVID. And actually it is extraordinary 
right? How beautiful the things are that people produce, how you can, of course, produce good clinics, good schools, good institutes, incredible products, restore buildings. Often what you're doing is you're trying to, though, in some sense, make things slowly better while preventing things getting any worse. But it would be a mistake to fantasize that somehow you're going to be able to solve all the fundamental problems. Thank you. Um, we've got another question about the places in between and your references to some of the sketches that you made of people. Uh, and this person's asking, have you ever published them and why did you draw them? So I, um, and this connects also to somebody asking me about my camera. Um, I took a very, very simple camera. I didn't actually want to take photographs at all. I took a camera very reluctantly with me and I promised myself I would only take one photograph a day. So uh, I took just enough film for the number of days of my walk. And I uh, ended up sometimes taking two photographs a day, which meant I then didn't take photographs on other days, um, in order to force me to sketch. And actually sketching worked very well. This also connects, somebody asked about my language speaking. Um, I learned Dari a little bit in Iran, and I had studied a Serbocrat and I'd studied Indonesian, and that had given me some of the Arabic loan words, which are also in Dari. I'd also studied a bit of Urdu in uh, Pakistan and a bit of Nepali in Nepal. And speaking Farsi, Dari, Urdu, Hindi, Nepali sounds like you're um, speaking a lot of languages, but you're not really. They're very closely related. That's like saying you speak sort of Spanish, Portuguese and Italian. Right? They're very surprisingly closely related languages. Um, but in the evenings, I would get quite tired trying to listen to conversations in Dari. And I would therefore often sit and sketch. Um, I'd get to a village before dark. I didn't like walking in the dark. And that meant that you often in the winter were getting there at sort of 4.35 in the afternoon. And you weren't going to be leaving again until probably seven in the morning. So that's nearly 14 hours that you've got. So sketching was a wonderful way of catching people's faces. And have I published? Yes. In the American edition of The Places in Between, in the most recent British edition, I've now put the sketches in. Great. So we're, everyone needs to dash out and buy the new edition, then, clearly. Um, we've had quite a few people asking if you've got any plans to do any further walking trips. Well, the, the current plan is to move to Jordan with my family and really work on bringing that site alive. And when I say bring it alive, what really interests me is the community. A lot of Syrian refugees have come out of Syria, nearly a million of them in Jordan. Very, very bad situations, um, left their homes. Some of them still living in uh, camps, refugee camps, others living on the edges or inside Jordanian towns and cities. Very difficult for them to work. And of course, the children, Syrian children, have lost touch with their own heritage and culture. They've often spent almost 10 years living in Jordan. So if they left as children, they know almost nothing about their homelands. So what I'm hoping to do is to use that community to work both with Syrian refugees and also with the local Jordanian community. There's nearly 70% unemployment in the nearby town. And by creating a really beautiful site and attracting sustainable tourism in to provide decent incomes and provide a reason for people to go to North Jordan, and to support the craft industry and create jobs through crafts and export those crafts for the Syrian refugees and indeed for Jordanians in the area. So that's my major objective. And in terms of journeys, my great fantasy uh, is to walk from northern Myanmar. We, we're doing a project also in uh, Myanmar and Rangoon, um, restoring buildings and working with textile weavers, to walk from northern Myanmar up into southwest China. Uh, but unfortunately, the coup d'etat in Myanmar has now made that absolutely impossible. Uh, the other two places I really want to spend time are Yemen and Mali. Um, and finally, I, I know I keep coming up with uh, ideas, um, probably the most alluring, mesmerizing country on earth if somebody's looking for somewhere to go on holiday is the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which is the most extraordinary place. I mean, obviously a giant country with the Congo River running right the way through it. The incredible variety from Kassai in the south to Goma in the east. Um, to Kinshasa in the West, um, everything from incredible jazz to gorillas in the Virunga National Park to extraordinary pieces of 
architecture to incredible landscapes and incredible people. So uh, someday the Congo. It sounds like a plan for the next few years, at least anyway. Um, there's another question which is slightly related to uh, your discussion about what you'll be doing in Jordan. And this is about the targeting of historic and architectural sites during war uh, and why they're such a kind of effective and prime target uh, at these times. So essentially there are um, two reasons why people go after archeological sites. And um, I, I suggest that both of them in the Afghan walk, but they're, they're true if you're talking about Syria as well. Um, they're true actually if you're talking about the bridge at Mostar in, in, um, in former Yugoslavia. In every case, uh, you do it for one of two reasons. You either do it because your enemy is located in that site and is trying to take shelter in those buildings. So you're doing it to get people or you do it symbolically. So as I mentioned, Genghis Khan deliberately destroyed all those buildings in the capital of Turkmenistan, leaving one, and by leaving one just to underscore the depth of that devastation. The Taliban blew up those Buddhas as a huge public statement, right? Obviously there were no Buddhists in the area. Those Buddhas posed no threat to Islam in Afghanistan. And there was, so there was no sense that anybody was about to start worshiping them. But the Taliban were seeking a form of ideological legitimacy. In other words, they were looking for something to reboost their flagging support base, deal with a situation where they weren't really governing the country properly, where they were on the edge of civil war. They were looking for something to feel decisive and strong and brave. And there's nothing quite like blowing something up. You, you notice it actually often with the um, mayors in United Kingdom, United States, when they're struggling for something to do, they blow up a tower block. They love the sort of the sense of something coming crumbling down to the ground. Um, there's also a sense in which these buildings can be very intimidating. They're very strange, haunting buildings. I mean, one of the common themes uh, of your exhibition and indeed of my work in uh, Umkais Gadar in Jordan and indeed of a lot of this work in Afghanistan is how strange it is to realize that you are looking at very substantial towns and cities, right? You know, Antioch uh, in Turkey, you know, had a community of 250, 500,000 people, which have then subsequently been completely abandoned. And there's something very um, strange and difficult as a human to take on board. You know, that site that I'm showing you in Jordan, which is called Gadara, uh, was very famous for philosophers, produced some extraordinary poets and philosophers. But by the time it was first documented by foreigners in the 19th century, consisted of about 25 people living in stone huts. Um, so I think there is also a sort of psychological urge for people sometimes to destroy things that haunt and intimidate them. So there's, there's a real sense of the ability of civilizations and uh, if those great civilizations can fall, what hope is there for contemporary rulers? Yeah. That's fascinating. Um, what other questions have we got? I've, I've had someone ask a couple of times whether you made notes as you walked, which you did, didn't you? I did, I wrote for about two hours a night uh, so I, and, and that wasn't just true in Afghanistan, that was true in Iran, Pakistan, India, and Nepal. I haven't published a book about the other year and a half of my walking, but I do have, I posted back whenever I got to a, a post office, a photocopy of my notebooks and the notebooks, and they're all piled up uh, at home in Scotland. Um, and do so you ever publish the other bags? Yeah, when I'm an old mad man, I'll have a look <laughs> at them all again. Or maybe I, I can, yeah. And one of my fantasies has been to do the walk again, spend two years doing the walk and see what has changed. But very sadly, in many ways, I fear a lot of those villages in Afghanistan and Iran and even Pakistan haven't changed as much in 20 years as you would have thought. It's not like China, where you turn up in Shanghai and you don't recognize anything. And it's, uh, um... I've got uh, a 
Another question asking, what is the real highlight? What's the thing that stands out in your mind from your walk? The thing that I took away most strongly is um, the way that Afghans lived. The extraordinary dignity and confidence of people living in a village which could be 10 days walk from the nearest road. Of women who'd often not been even four hours walk from their home, never seen the local market town. So the most isolated places imaginable. And you might think that if you lived in a valley like that, in a collection of um, 20 buildings made of earth with no electricity, with nobody able to read and write, um, living a very, very difficult life of subsistence farming that you might struggle. But of course, actually what I found is that people had a form of dignity and self-confidence that I've never seen in Britain. The headmen of these little villages carried themselves like kings. They had much more dignity and self-possession than British prime ministers, for example, who I, I've known a number of, right? They carried themselves with extraordinary grace and dignity. And I think it reminded me of the, at a time in my life, I was in my late twenties, where I imagined that the way to make something of myself or to find meaning in my life was to see as many places as possible and to sort of do extraordinary things. I realized with those people that although they had traveled almost nowhere and possessed almost nothing, they could create a full meaning of their life without being able to read or write in a very remote village in the center of Afghanistan and perhaps more dignity and meaning than I was able to scurrying across half the world. That's fascinating. It sounds like it was a real rite of passage in that sense. Oh, it um, was so, so wonderful. And another question that's come in on the Q&A, what did these people think about you and your journey? Well, that's a difficult question. Um, I mean, I think part of the issue is there's not necessarily a great frame of reference. I mean, the remember most of the people meeting me as I walk across central Afghanistan, nobody had, as far as I know, done that journey on foot, I, I don't know for how long, um, but no outsider had done that journey, certainly since the 1970s, even using vehicles. Right? And then in the summer in the 1970s, some hippies would have done these journeys and some things. But that really meant that for 40 years, nobody had really seen a, 30, 40 years, nobody had really seen a, an outsider. So people often focus on questions like whether I was a Muslim. They were very interested when I said that I wasn't in questions like, how many times I prayed. I mean, it was interesting that the people weren't very, as, as, and certainly as you can imagine, people were not very impressed with the fact that I'd you know, walked 6,000 miles because that was something that every single person I saw was perfectly capable of doing. <laughs> and knew many people who'd walked much longer distances than I had. Um, so, but it was, but in a sense, it was incredibly wonderful and reassuring to realize that they didn't think that I was anything strange or exceptional, that they were comfortable accepting me, particularly towards the end, as I became more tired and thinner. I mean, there was very little food around. Um, I did begin to feel sometimes when I turned on people's houses that um, I was getting sort of a little bit more of an insight into what they were going through. And therefore we were able to relate on the level of people who um, were living in the middle of an Afghan winter and didn't have a great deal to eat. Although, of course, um, I always had the option of leaving in a way that people didn't. Right? And so um, there's always uh, something very strange about that type of traveling because you're living two lives at the same time. And then I think this will probably need to be our final question. Um, and this is one asking whether you think there'll ever be a place for you to bring your international mindedness back into British politics. Uh, 
Right. Um, well, uh, I felt very, very lucky to uh, be able to be in British politics. And I was incredibly lucky to be able to run for the leadership because it gave me an opportunity to try to uh, lay out um, some ideas of what I thought the country should be. I thought it was incredibly freeing. When you're a backbench MP and even when you're a junior minister, you're very trapped in terms of how you can vote, what you can do, you're very much part of a party machine. And when I ran for leadership, suddenly for the first time, I was able to try to talk honestly about, for example, the fact that I thought we treated um, old people very badly in Britain, that adult social care is, is a disgrace. Um, it gave me an opportunity to obviously try to argue against a no deal Brexit, but also to try to argue for a different type of politics that I thought it wasn't necessary to go down a particularly kind of extreme populist route. Um, so that was a great gift to be able to have the opportunity and the platform to do that. And I was incredibly uh, lucky to be able to get quite a lot of MPs to support me and to get quite a long way in the leadership campaign. But in the end, obviously I lost. And then I think the second thing about politics, which is important, comes in. So if the first bit is about having the opportunity to try as honestly as you can to share a vision of the country, the second thing that's important is to know when to say no. In, in many ways, the most important thing in politics is not what you say no to or what you accept, but what you refuse and what you uh, don't do, right? And I, felt that in the end, having said, this is my vision of the country and feeling very strongly that Boris Johnson's vision of the country was not mine, that it was also my responsibility to say no and step aside rather than, as some of my colleagues felt, for very understandable other reasons that what they needed to do was keep serving in the cabinet and keep supporting the party. Um, and the problem in politics is once you've said no once, once you've resigned and left, it is extremely difficult to get back in. I mean, I now have no constituency, no seat in parliament and no party. I have a prime minister who is very angry with me. Uh, and of course, uh, no other natural political party to go to. So the chances are probably, um, it'll be quite difficult to work out how to get back in. That may have been a one shot, which may be why I have to go and focus on Jordan. Well, Rory, thank you so much. Um, for an absolutely fascinating talk. I think you've really shared a new light on the works in the ex exhibition, um, but also on contemporary Afghanistan and of that, on that experience of walking. Um, we would like to take this opportunity to thank you for your time. We know how busy you are. Um, it's a real privilege to have you come and speak to us um, and to wish you all the very best in Jordan. It sounds like such an exciting uh, project. I also just wanted to take this opportunity to thank the luxury jewellery brand Pomolato who have supported this evening's talk. Uh, and of course, everyone who's joined us this evening uh, from wherever you are in the world, um, do visit our website. There you can download a curator's tour of the Romance of Ruins. You can buy tickets to come and visit the exhibition. You can purchase our exhibition catalogue as well. And you can also see details of two more uh, talk series. On the 10th of June, we've got our deputy director, Helen Dory, who invites you to join her in exploring our little known building archive. And on the 14th of June, our very popular by design talk series starts again, looking at the impact of design on the lives of world renowned designers. Uh, so we'll ve we very much hope that you'll be able to come and visit us in person at Sir John Soane's Museum in London. And on that note, thank you, Rory, and thank you, everyone, and good night. Um, well, thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks for having me.